I understand uh, very well this topics that um, a familiar uh, picture uh, for most of you, namely the typical system related to the five uh, sum matrix. Yeah. Now it's 
just uh, it just uh, uh, for, for for that formula I don't need a specific formula for R, but yeah, it would appear as you might be right. You should just take this matrix. You should take so you take this matrix substitute instead of uh, TTN and make an detector as R on the zero and the nth and, and the first factor identity of the rest. And same for the rest of the uh, factors named as multiply. So in the end you get a matrix which would have coefficients strictly speaking in polynomials in U and T1, T. And after that the usual yoga from uh, the theory in Fadeev school and many others. Uh, so that naturally comes as a block diagonal to white matrix, as a block to white matrix, uh, block with respect to the zero space, the apparatus which go to the blocks are called A, B, C, D. E. And they depend on the parameter U and of course they depend on T1, T, T N. But the point is that this matrix would be of size, of course, 2 to the n plus 1 times 2 to the n plus 1, therefore the blocks would be of size 2 to the n by 2 to the n. And if I expand now each A, B, C, and D in a polynomial, in this case in U, I get operators or matrices whose coefficient depend on their T1 here, and therefore would act on my quantum space. For me, this is the definition of the young Baxter algebra related to uh, uh, this, or generated by this R matrix. So it's the associative algebra. I mean, it's a sub algebra, the matrix algebra generated by the coefficients of uh, polynomials A of U. A of U, C of U, D of U. I mean, uh, so um, once you have uh, this apparatus, the next important step, so, so far, every mathematician would not be impressed, most of the mathematicians would not be impressed, so what I produced uh, what appears to be like almost generic sub algebra and the matrix algebra, what can I say about it? Virtually nothing. But if in addition I assume that my R matrix, particular the one written upstairs satisfies the young Baxter equation, then many interesting things can be said. In particular, two important things I want to single out so that go number three, namely the coefficients of the operator A commute for different values of U and B. But more than that, if I Take the transfer matrix generated by the coefficients of the sum A of D plus U of D it also commute to the self for U and B being different. So, in other words, I already have two huge commutative subalgebras in a matrix algebra, and that is. So, and that is already for a mathematician a big deal because, as I said, you expect, it's, it's a theorem if you wish, that a generic subalgebra in a matrix algebra would be close to a free algebra, no relations. And this is the maximal possible collection of relations everything can be used. It's cool. Uh, with a little effort, slightly modifying the R matrix, you can actually make one parameter family, so Q is a parameter. You can introduce a parameter and then you would have a one parameter family of matrices which commute to the child and its form would be A of U plus Q uh, U. So the appearance of this quantum parameter is uh, almost for free on the integrable system side, but maybe if I have time to explain in geometry, it is actually interesting. Yeah, it, you need to introduce the Q bar. Yeah, 
but it's sort of almost automatic. Okay, so, uh, so that Q parameter deformation of your community family is an important thing for sure. Next thing is, uh, of course, once I have a family of community operators, I mostly concentrated this load on this one. Obviously, we all know that there is a basis where they all simultaneously diagonal, so there is uh, a basis uh, called Beatty uh, basis, which in which a of u is diagonal, and it's uh, obtained by quite an ingenious procedure, certainly not so far uh, too familiar to most of the mathematicians, which is called Bayton thus procedure, so it amounts to solving a non-trivial system of uh, algebraic equations, uh, and then some standard operator, namely the vacuum vector with the V or C, uh, depending on the choice of the vacuum, applied to it consecutively many times and replacing the arbitrary spectrum parameter by solutions in the weight and thus equation produces for you a full set of eigenvectors. So that's very important. So, uh, but uh, for the talk, as I said, I'd like to point out that together with the usual uh, spin basis, I have another basis uh, in, on the side of a technical system, which is called the beta vector basis. Okay, so that's basically the 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 theory so far, and now the journey. So the claim is uh, I can't uh, remember whether Paul already made it. If not, I just uh, I do it. If he did, I repeat it. So the magic so far is that there is a picture in geometry uh, which was developed totally out of different reasons, which matches this one virtually word for word. And I will identify these two pictures for you at least to the best of my ability. And once you have two non-trivial pictures identified, identified, you can play many interesting games right away, trying to say something about one, using what you know about another, and the other way around. Geometric interpretation of every single feature you see on the black. The geometric interpretation of the young Baxter equation, I believe you could extract or it was given in Paul's talk, where he explained this this uh, R matrix naturally comes as a transition matrix between two natural bases in the cohomology of T1. So uh, because you can that's also a statement you can think about it because it's a change of basis matrix, then the young Baxter equation normally comes out. The fact that you change it to natural from you have a family of naturally defined bases and you go from the first to the second and after that to the third and to different ways. But since you start and end up with a particular with the same basis, you start with one and end up with the same, the chain of transitions must be the same. It amounts to yeah, faster equations and equations to be satisfied. I will instead interpret every other feature of this picture in terms of geometry. Uh, which equations? No, it's, uh, it comes from uh, the specific geometric way of defining the basis in the cohomology as, as, as I, I, if, if I have time, but I would rather, because of Paul already talked quite a bit about the appearance of our matrix, I would rather indicate what the other features in this picture are, so that you would have a bigger I will do it to the best of my ability. Of course, we can always get together after the talk and, uh, and do it in private. But uh, in, in the talk, I try to proceed as far as I can along the lines of the outline I just made. So, first of all, what is the uh, quantum space? So, the quantum space for me come, would come as equivariant cohomology of this 
certain algebraic parameters. So uh, let me decode all the words here. First of all, an algebraic variety. It's a simple thing. It means that it would be given by a series uh, of a set of algebraic equations, polynomial equations in a large projective space. Topologist, uh, it, it, it's been it's been uh, always a problem. So if you, if if, if your uh, manifold parameters, if your space is given by a set of zeros of a certain uh, collection of equations, tell something to tell something about the geometry of this thing is quite complicated. So instead, what topologists do, they take a space X, and if it's possible, split it into elementary bricks of which the bricks which look like the simplest possible space ever. So in my case, X would be a collection of so-called the Grassmann, Grassmannian manifolds, whose points are very easy to describe. So a point of uh, the Grassmannian manifold K N, where K fixed and N fixed, is simply a K-dimensional subspace in N-dimensional complex vector space. It's union. So obviously, when k is different, the pieces not, do not talk to each other. The collection of line and the collection of uh, planes are, are, are unrelated. So it's going to be a disjoint union. So they are not. Any k between zero and n, yeah, it's it's an integer, right? It just tells you what dimensional subspaces you're taking. In your fixed and dimensional space. It, it would be, of course, related to the subspace whose bases have k ones in the quantum space. Remember the spin bases? It's the length of chain, exactly. And k would indicate this the subspace of weight k, whatever you call it. Uh, so, as I said, the idea of considering lines, planes, and uh, high dimensional subspaces as, as points is extremely revolutionary at the time. So, it's a, in this description, it's not even clear that it's an algebraic manifold. It doesn't take much to write a set of equations which describe uh, this algebraic variety inside of large enough. In, in particular, I want to say if k is equal to 1, we deal into the familiar projective space, the space of lines. You don't need any equations. It's already pn, right? So there would be no equations when k is equal to 1. You would get typically one equation uh, in some cases when k is equal to 2 and so on. So the number of equations grows. The equations itself are not particularly interesting to me. I better give you, as I said, a different description of this space, which uses decomposition of it into very, very simple spaces. So those spaces are so-called Schubert cells, and they are indexed by the same data, by zero, one terms. And of course, if I'm talking about the Grassmannian uh, of uh, uh, k dimensional subspaces and n dimensional space, then it would be zero one growth with k ones. Okay. So I give myself I give myself one of this, call it lambda. So it's a zero one group. And then I write uh, the appropriate uh, uh, sugar cell in the Grassmannian K S. So it's going to be made so this sugar cell indexed by the zero one group by definition is a K-dimensional 
encapsulates inside of my standard seat there. In the condition, I have it here W, so you can think about the same bit. With the following condition, oh, I forgot a very important thing. Before I do everything, I fix in my CN a reference flag, namely a system of subspaces uh, who are nested the previous sitting inside of the next one and the co-dimension of two consecutive, I mean the difference of dimension of two consecutive is one. It's called the flag. Choose full flag. Choose the basis and then take the standard flag. E1, the span of E1 and E2, and so on. The span So E1, EN is a standard basis of C there, the one you've chosen. And then you make a full flag by taking the first vector, first two, first three, and so on. So uh, I would call this elements of the flag FI, so it's the span of E1, EI, just to show. All right. So the flag is fixed, and then the condition which defines this S is the form. The dimension of W intersecting F I plus 1 over the intersection of W and F I is equal to lambda I. So lambda I is either 1 or 0. It's a 0, 1 group. sequence of length n of zeros and ones, so it's equal to either one or zero. So if, if I'm given this lambda, I collect all w's with this condition. So let us look maybe at a simple example, two dimension, right? Two dimension space, you have two uh, basis vector, e1 and e2. The full flag is I, e1 and the whole space e1 and e2. So what is uh, uh, the uh, sugared cell which corresponds to 0, 1 root, 1, 0? Well, it means that it's a one-dimensional subspace which intersects the line generated by E1 with dimension 1. But after that, if you consider the intersection with the highest space over the intersection with the previous, the dimension must be 0. So that singles out the only possible subspace, namely this line generated by E1. Okay. So it's a point in a projected space, just one line. And the Schubert cell indexed by 0, 1, it means that it does not intersect E1 at all. So it's any other line which is not E1. So the collection of them obviously makes a two-dimensional, well, one-dimensional, complex, one-dimensional, open space, which it's, no, in this case, the first sugar variety which corresponds to this is just one point. And the and other sugar variety, in this case, is the rest. So, sugar cell, I'm looking so far, I'm talking about sugar cell. In your favorite picture of P1 as being two-dimensional sphere, so the first sugar cell is a point, and the other sugar cell is everything minus this point, clearly homeomorphic to complex plane. And that is uh, a general picture. So you always have this varieties, sugar cells, being uh, isomorphic or equal to uh, a vector space of a smaller dimension. Smaller or equal dimension. Now, of course, you can take a closure of them, like you take the point, the closure of the point is a point. Or you take the other sugar cell, which is everything but point. You take a closure inside of sphere, and you get the whole thing. Once you take the closure, you get, um, you get uh, uh, a closure 
of southern Italy. And that's already called Schubert cycle. Now, what is a homology? I will erase maybe something. What is homology and cohomology naively? So let me stick to this example. So I define for you two vector spaces. One is called the homology of the Gersmani, and the other is called cohomology of the Gersmani. And out of two vector spaces, one would have even more structure. It would be a ring. So this is a vector space over complex numbers, virtually generated by Schubert. Cycles. So it just it doesn't tell you much, right? It just there is a finite number of super cycles, and I take the the uh, uh, vector space generated by them. Now the only interesting thing is how many of them do you get? Well, how many? It, it, it's the that notation means a vector space over complex numbers with this basic. It's always C. Yeah, it was coefficients in C. I mean, if I want C, I would put C. I would, uh, if I want integers, I could put here integers. I would have consider three C module with this basis. So the, the elements of this is just formal linear combinations of sugar two. Right, these are cycles. Yeah. Yeah, all of them. Yeah, all of them. Think, of course, it, it's going to be a graded, a graded vector space because cycles would have a dimension. It's an extra feature. Of course, you know, as I said, at this point I didn't tell you much. It just that I, I said uh, take all these uh, sugar cycles and that's it. But even that simple picture indicates that sugar cycles are related. If you take a sugar cell, it's an open thing in its closure you find other Schubert cells, right? So on the set of cells, there is actually a partially ordered set relation, which is virtually defined by the condition that uh, a cell is smaller than another cell if it sits within the closure of another cell. And because it doesn't have to sit in the closure of a given cell, it's only a partial order rather than a linear order. Right? So in the case of P1, the partial order is rather simple. So you have two sugar cells, the big one and the small one, and uh, the relation goes like that because this sits inside of the closure of this. And uh, that picture indicates the way you make a complicated manifold out of a simple one. Namely, you took in this case a point and you attach to it a two-dimensional vector space, which happens to be complex numbers, by collapsing, by arranging the boundary. And that, that always happens like that with sugar varieties. If we had time, I would uh, do for you, say, the picture of really non trivial manifold. So it's actually a quadric, meaning that it, it cuts out, it is being cut out by a single quadratic relation from the projective space. But its decomposition into sugar cells is quite interesting. So you would have the biggest one. As always, which corresponds to the, uh, to the uh, 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 zero one word of length two of uh, length four with two ones. So that would be the largest. And after that, you would have a slightly smaller one. And after that, you would have an even smaller one and another small one. But these two do not already, uh, uh, are not already come. And then it would meet again at the point uh, 1, 0, 1, 0, and finally the last one at the beginning. So this is a complicated system of building a, a manifold, a complicated manifold, out of very simple pieces. Each piece would have, this one would have complex dimension uh, 4 and uh, 
three, two, one, and zero. And and uh, uh, of course, when I define for you uh, the homology by this condition, it means that essentially ignore it. But in, in this case, but but the proper way of doing it, of course, to incorporate it and and then pull. Uh, the appropriate feature in differential, it would be linear operator of certain vector space, squares to zero, and then the homology or homology would come as kernel over the image, blah, blah, blah. It's just in this case, you don't see it. Likewise, the homology, I define it for you as functions from homology. complex numbers. Which is all possible functions, vector space. Well, one interesting thing you notice right away, as I said, this has an interesting extra feature, namely it is uh, a rainbow whose functions you can point twice, multiply, and add. So that's, uh, uh, this is the uh, uh, technology. And now I need one more uh, generalization of this concept. I mean, obviously, from the construction, as there's many and many forms, as I explained there, they have a GLN action, general linear group of, uh, uh, of matrices and band, and therefore uh, a subgroup of it made out of diagonal matrices. But, yes, so L for linear. So that all acts on Grassmannian, any Grassmannian, simply because the points of the Grassmannian are subspaces, a linear map, map subspace on subspace. So uh, the way to incorporate this extra information is. Yeah, yeah. On the sugar cycle schools. Yeah. Um, so in order to incorporate this extra data, I would uh, introduce so-called equivalent homology and equivalent homology. So the difference, say, in this case, uh, I will mostly concentrate on it, would be, first of all, of course, now, uh, a C replay is going to be replaced, and that just taken. So the C in the usual setting is replaced by polynomial T1, Tn, which I can view as, as the uh, characters of my torus, my diagonal matrices, various homomorphisms of diagonal matrices to C, and that's exactly polynomial ring in T1, Tn. So instead of taking functions of sugar cycles to C, I take it to the polynomials. But that's not the end of the story, because now I need to erase the equality sign here, and I can define without going into too many details, the equivalent homology of the Grassmannian as being a certain subset of these functions. And this subset definitely will take into account these pictures. So you will see the geometric structure of decomposing your manifold into elementary bricks in the structure of equivalent homology. That, that I can explain quite uh, fast, and if time, if time so open, I suppose to stop. 15 minutes, comes out in 15. I have 15 minutes. Okay, so because time is short, I'll, I'll proceed. Um, so, just uh, uh, a second. I, I feel uh, I'm, I'm, I'm still here. Right? I'm explaining the vector space. So now, in this, uh, uh, so, uh, uh, so, of course, uh, the functions would be a module over a polynomial ring because you can always multiply a function by one particular polynomial, you get another.
another function. So this operation would preserve my subset. So the offshot of that is that this has a natural detection of the renomally T1 theory. Uh -huh. And uh, the basis of this space, delta functions, are still have the same number as the number of sugar cycles. So sugar cycles indexed by uh, 0, 1 periods, therefore when I allow k to vary, then the dimension of this sum, rank of this model, of module of this sum over the polynomial ring, so the rank of it, is going to be 2 to the n, just like the rank of my quantum space. So that gives me the possibility to make a really brave move and say, aha, uh -huh, two spaces coincide. So why don't I identify this space, which as I said, would be a subset in all possible functions of super sets of polynomial ring with this subset. First brave step is now, so I'm V F. Right, right. So of, if I if I if I could do only on the that I wouldn't be speaking here, right? So I'm just like as I said, I would explain to you all the features. So that's feature number one. My quantum space V, as I defined it, will be identified with the sum, the direct sum of rings, which are equivalent cohomology of the Grassmannian uh, of the sum. So, so far, as, as you pointed out, not much has been done. It's just uh, uh, I identified simply because the rank is the same. Well, now, in the equivalent pedagogy, there is a very distinct basis. So, as I said, the torus acts on the grass onion, and therefore, we can look at the fixed points of this action. So, what would be the fixed point? Well, once you fix the basis in your CN, then any K plane made out of coordinate lines is fixed, right? Because, no, it's the geometry, now geometry. You, you, you take the Grassmannian and diagonal matrices of N by N act, as I said. So, what are the geometrically fixed points? And of course, these points can be obtained by picking up k coordinate lines of multiplication by diagonal matrix. Yeah, so Tn acts on the ambient space and therefore acts on all the subspaces, but if I choose a subspace made out of coordinate lines, then scaling them does not change the subspace. So it's going to be a fixed point, geometric fixed point. So there would be exactly n choose k fixed points, which again indexed by 0, 1 words, except that this time 0, 1 words tell you, uh, words tell you which coordinate line you pick. If it's 0, you don't take this line. If it's 1, you take this line. And then having this uh, fixed points, I can define a different basis in here. I will take delta functions, so not on sugar cycles, but on fixed points. So there is a distinct other basis. Yeah, because everything is indexed by the same 0, 1 words, except that they have different means. So there is uh, another basis. namely delta functions on 
fixed point. Well, to say that it's another basis of a polynomial ring is not quite right. You would need uh, 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 to, um, uh, inter to invert some polynomials to uh, identify them. It's clear. I mean, on the one hand, you take delta functions on the manifolds, and on the other hand, you take delta functions on all points. Unlikely that it would, you know, the change would happen over uh, complex numbers. You would need to invert some polynomials. So maybe after some uh, in inversion of the polynomials, you have another basis. And now I'm prepared to tell you what this basis has to do with beta vectors. So next point, under my identification, so the spin basis here would be identified with uh, the basis of uh, delta Hilbert functions and the beta basis would be identified with the fixed point points delta functions. So far, okay, but what is the real uh, confirmation that uh, uh, what I'm getting on the geometry side has anything real to do with the integrable system? I, I didn't give you the R yet, and I, uh, given the time, might not give you, but I tell you what the operator A is going to be. Well, let me tell you first what, let me tell you first what uh, never been told in this room yet. In this room, all says something I might comment on the R matrix, but uh, R matrix is not yet the whole integral system. The interesting thing is that I will identify for you the young Baxter operators now in this picture. Yeah, A, B, C, and D. In particular, the most important operator I identify is the A operator. Oh, 
multiplication by this operator would be an operator on my set of functions. Right? I take a function, I multiply it by a different function, and I made the generated functions. So I claim that the action of the operator A on this space restriction of the operator A on the space uh, uh, in the quantum space with K once in 0, 1, 0. The action of this operator is nothing else and be identified with the multiplication by these functions. The, if, if I had time, I would explain to you that these functions represent a very important geometric concept. They are short classes of the tautological vector bundle of the Grassmannian, but since I've chosen such an elementary representation of pedagogy, I just tell you that. And this, so just because time is getting short, let me maybe, uh, maybe uh, 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 draw a certain line here. So, so far I just suggested three identification. I said, let us identify this with this, and that with that. But then it's a theory that then the operator A would be identified with this multiplication by this very geometric function. So this is already a theory. And uh, uh, in the world of combinatorics, multiplication by these functions, elementary symmetric functions, is coined by the name Peter. And that is by far one of the moving questions in, in combinatorics. What is the Peter? How you, you take short functions, you multiply by a very simple function, what is the expansion on the basis of short functions? So that that is what it has to do with. So that is already serious. In, in, in the geometric situation, we identified an operator which abstractly was defined by this R matrix and, uh, and uh, proved that this identification actually correct. Well, I want to point out, if I'm sure you're familiar with the Peary uh, rule in the build of Schubert functions. So the fact that everything comes from integral model says that this Peary rule is built from the elementary brick from two dimensions, and after that you take things and factors, can't say. It's the splitting, the splitting of the monodromy matrix into the product is what mathematicians were never aware of until recently. That in fact the Peary rule can be obtained from a very, very simple example from two dimensions. After that you build it according to the uh, R, T, 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 R procedure. So how much time? Five more minutes. All right, very good. So uh, the rest of the operators are more involved geometrically, and and that was uh, 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 that was uh, that this is what would go in the title, in the original title, convolution algebra. So the rest of the operators I also can identify absolutely geometrically, absolutely standard mathematical terms. In fact, they all live in a standard object in representation theory people study for, for forever. It's called the convolution algebra. Maybe instead of that, I, instead of that I, 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 I do two things. I comment a little bit on this little Q, the one parameter family, and then maybe I'll once again repeat how our matrix is. So Q, um, so on, 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 on this side we have a very natural and simple deformation of the commutative uh, uh, of, of one dimensional community family, where do we see this? Well, so functions I can multiply with a ring. Right? It's a nice, but uh, there is a very natural deformation of this ring into a one dimensional family of which this particular ring corresponds to the value of the parameter equal to zero. So it's a quantization sense. And this uh, Deformation of this product, the naive product of functions, uh, goes by the name quantum cohomology, and it was actually introduced in in, uh, in uh, conformal field theories and sigma model in particular by Waffa, I believe, many years ago. So what it amount, amounts to? Well, so in order to so this algebra as a vector space of a polynomial is finite dimension. It means you multiply two elements 
you can expand the product in the basis. And then the coefficients of this expansion are called structure constants. It's what defines multiplication, right? So the structure constants can be deformed in such a way that you replace a number or a polynomial, in this case, in T1, Tn, by a polynomial in T1, Tn, and Of course, a good question is, I mean, it's clear if you just arbitrarily deform your structure constants and take them as a new structure constants, you wouldn't get an associative function work on it, you would get that most work. So the, the beauty of this deformation defined geometrically uh, is exactly that. So Waffle suggested the procedure of deforming the original structure constants in such a way that uh, the newly defined algebra, if you take this result in structure constants, as structure constants would be associative and community. And, and he, for that, he used the enumerating geometry. So this deformation uh, parameter would have as a coefficient a peculiar number. It's going to be, so you have a deformation parameter, it, 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 so the case power of this parameter would have a coefficient in front of it, uh, which is the number of spheres or maps from a sphere to dimensional sphere to your manifold algebraic maps of uh, degree k. So the cleavage of one point consists of k points. Of course, the fact that such a number is finite is, is, is by, by itself an interesting fact for, for these types of manifolds. But it turns out to be either finite or, uh, or zero. And then you can deform. And this extremely sophisticated deformation can, uh, 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 on, on that side, simply can size the deformation by adding Q times D to the operator A, A on, on the integral system side. And that we find absolutely amazing, and we don't have any explanation of it. So the deformation you know very well on the integral system side is. Uh, as the, as the, the counterpart on the, on the, on the, on the geometric side is, a, is quite delicate geometric information. And that is a theory that you can identify this through. And it's a very mysterious theory. We, 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 we have observed it numerically, but we need to understand the meaning of it. It's, it's extremely interesting. So how come your information sees all the curves sitting inside of a complicated manifold? So, 